Sounds good. Andrew. Andrew. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Budoni just texted me. He said he can't seem to join the link. He has to start his Teams with HI first. Uh, yeah, he's got to log into Teams with his Ottawa Heart and Perfect. then click the join link. You need to. Uh, There we go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Wednesday morning uh, rounds. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Meng Guo from uh, uh, cardiac surgery. He um, did his uh, medical training at the uh, University of uh, Toronto, and then now he's one of our fifth year cardiac surgery residents. Um, he's also an avid hiker. Um, he uh, is going to be talking today on the natural history of thoracic aortic aneurysms, um, and his uh, his uh, staff supervisor today is Dr. Budwani, who's also uh, joined as one of the moderators. So uh, we welcome uh, Ming, and we look forward to your presentation this morning. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ming. I'm one of the cardiac surgery resident. Thank you for joining us for Grand Rounds. Today, I'll be talking to you about the natural history of thoracic aortic aneurysm and the implications uh, for their management. Thoracic aortic aneurysm is often an incidental finding discovered on imaging or echocardiogram. Most of the time, it's an indolent process that develops over many years and does not cause the patient much problems that is until an aortic dissection occurs. Aortic dissection is essentially caused by a tear in the inner layer of the aorta, allowing blood to track between the layers, causing malperfusion to the brain, the heart, and exsanguination from rupture or tamponade. This is what it looks like in the operating room. The dissecting part is paper thin. Despite years of experience treating this condition, the mortality rate is still very high with approximately 20% risk of mortality with surgical management in the first 21 days after presentation. This is just for patients who made it to the hospital for assessment and does not account into the damage uh, to caused to the organs from malperfusion, prolonged hospital or ICU stay, as well as distal aortic complications down the line. Therefore, although thoracic aortic aneurysm normally don't affect the patient, when it becomes a problem, it's a life and death situation. Well, then the best course of action is really to get rid of the risk from the root before bad things occur. This is accomplished by resecting the aneurysm and replacing it with a tube graft. This is what it looks like in the operating room. This essentially gets rid of the abnormal section of the aorta. However, because we're offering patients who are asymptomatic surgery to prevent possible complications down the road, timing in this case is everything. 
In a classic paper from 1997, the authors found a hinge point of 6.0 centimeter, uh, at which the risk of aortic complications increased drastically. Based on studies predominantly from this group, the current guideline recommends replacing an aneurysm at 5.5 centimeter to decrease risk of future aortic complications. Well, that's pretty intuitive so far. So what's the problem? Well, there's actually a bit of controversy surrounding this. Let's say you have a 60-year-old patient in the clinic, otherwise healthy with a degenerative ascending aortic aneurysm. At what point would you offer this patient surgery? We took this question and surveyed 148 cardiac surgeons in Canada. As you can see here, uh, red is size less than 5.5 centimeter and pink is size greater or equal to 5.5 centimeter. 20% of surgeons we surveyed will offer surgery when aneurysm is less than 5.5 centimeter, lower than the threshold recommended by guidelines. In addition, as we modify a single clinical variable of the patient within the scenario, it changes the surgical threshold at which point some surgeon will offer surgery. Why is this? Is this just a simply a difference of opinion and personal experience? or is there more to it? In the following 30 minutes or so, we'll review some of the reasons contributing to the discrepancy in the practice, including the pathophysiology and hemodynamics of thoracic aortic aneurysm, our current evidence on the natural history and surgical management, and what we can do about it to make it less confusing. For pathophysiology and hemodynamics, we'll talk about thoracic aortic aneurysm as a whole, while for natural history and surgical management, we'll focus on ascending aortic aneurysm as, as that is our predominant patient population. The aorta is composed of three layers, the intima, media, and adventitia. The intima layer is occupied by a layer of endothelial cells that provide lining to the inner surface of the aorta. The adventitia layer is mainly composed of myofibroblasts, which produce collagen and provide strength, as well as vasovasorum and nerves. The medial layer provides elastic recoil for pulsatile aortic pressure, which is enabled by its composition of one, the vascular smooth muscle cells, and two, extracellular matrix as well as components, including elastin, collagen, and fibrillin. Altogether, the homeostasis of the aortic wall is maintained by a balanced composition of these cells and structures. An imbalance of these cells and proteins lead to adverse remodeling, which lead to aortic aneurysm. Vascular smooth muscle cells are the major cell type within the aortic wall. They possess the ability to regulate proteins involved in contraction in response to mechanical stimulus, as well as synthesis of proteins within the extracellular matrix. What you see here is a laminar unit, which is essentially a vascular smooth muscle cell and its extracellular matrix. This is a basic building block of the medial layer. The extracellular matrix is comprised of many different proteins, each with its own unique role. Elastin is the major component responsible for stretch. Loss of elastin function can lead to unrestricted smooth muscle cell proliferation and stiffening of the aorta. Five types of collagen providing strength. Fibrillin, which becomes incorporated into microfibrils, uh, is a major contributor to mechanical strength of the aortic wall. And fibrillin, which is an important part in elastic fiber formation and is a key in managing aortic homeostasis. These proteins are all interspersed within the, uh, with the vascular smooth muscle cells, forming individual laminar units. Mutations in the genes for each of these units have clinical consequences. The main pathway in which these proteins regulate each other, as well as by the vascular smooth muscle cells, is through transforming growth factor beta-1, TGF-beta-1. TGF-beta-1 is now recognized as a key component in the pathogenesis of thoracic aortic aneurysm. For example, Fibrillin 1 acts as a potent uh, regulator for TGF beta 1. Reduced or mutated form of fibrillin 1 stimulates the release of TGF beta 1 and increases its activity. Once active TGF beta 1 is free in the matrix, it binds to TGF beta receptor, which induces a signaling cascade, ultimately activating matrix metalloproteinase, leading to matrix degradation. Mutations in components along the TGF beta signaling pathway have been linked to several conditions leading to thoracic aortic aneurysm. Matrix metalloproteinase can be produced by many cell types, including vascular smooth muscle cells and inflammatory cells. 
in response to inflammation and oxidative stress. It causes extracellular matrix degradation through direct proteolysis, as well as remodeling and processing of extracellular matrix proteins. Whereas healthy aerobic tissue on the left shows little expression of MMPs, increased MMPs in the picture on the right lead to destruction of the medial layer, and their expression is consistently observed in thoracic aerobic aneurysm specimens. So how does the function or malfunctioning of these proteins and molecules translate into clinical pathologies? Like the three branches of the aortic arch, thoracic aortic aneurysm is grouped into three groups. Syndromic TA are defined as aneurysm that occur in conjunction with a range of associated anomalies affecting various body systems. Non-syndromic familial TAs refer to a group of TAs occurring as a single manifestation, but follow a familial uh, pattern of inheritance. Erratic uh, TAs refer to TAs occurring in isolation and do not show any familial transmission. They encompass a range of cause, uh, causative ideologies, but the precise uh, mechanism is poorly understood. This is a, list, a short list of some of the more well-known syndromic TAs. Marfan syndrome is caused by mutation in the fibrillin 1 gene, as well as marked increase in TGF-beta activity. Louis Dietz syndrome is caused by mutations in the TGF-beta receptor genes. Rulers Dalmo syndrome, a vascular type, is caused by mutation in gene coding for type 3 collagen. Non syndromic familial TAs is a really interesting group. Firstly, they're all named by numbers. They tend to be autosomal dominant, but with variable penetrance within the family. The MYH11 gene, ACTA2 gene, MYLK gene, and PRKG gene for uh, familial thoracic aortic enzyme 4, 6, 7, and 8 all affect the function of vascular smooth muscle cells. So overall, syndromic and non-syndromic familial TAs are generally affected by these three major group of cellular processes, namely the extracellular matrix homeostasis, transforming growth factor beta signaling, and contraction of smooth muscle cells, as we have previously reviewed. Spiralic TAs are still, as far as we know now, the majority of patients that we see. Although that may change as more patients undergo genetic testing and more mutations are identified. Of these four, much of our current data is still for degenerative TAAs. We really do not know much about the other cases uh, as they are quite rare and they're not the focus of the presentation. Therefore, to summarize, the formation of thoracic aortic aneurysm is heavily influenced by aortic wall homeostasis between smooth muscle cells, elastin, collagen, and other proteins within the extracellular matrix regardless of the clinical identity and ideology of the aneurysm. However, as we discussed, even though genetics plays a role, this is often not caused by particular mutations in the protein regulating homeostasis, but rather adverse remodeling as a result of aging, as well as response to environmental stimulus. So how does adverse remodeling occur in this case? Aortic functional hemodynamics, as we're learning, may play a significant role. The aorta is a dynamic and elastic structure. During systole, it expands, and during diastole, it contracts and acts as a second pump to help coronary and systemic perfusion. The aorta becomes stiffer, however, as elastic fibers from the lamina media of the aorta are damaged and replaced by collagen fibers, causing substantial increase in aortic resistance and changes in central pulse wave pressure. As the aorta stiffens, its pressure buffering abilities are compromised, leading to increase in postal arterial load. Aortic stiffness is known to be inversely associated with the health of the aortic wall, as well as as an independent predictor of adverse cardiovascular events in the general population. This diagram describes the typical relationship between intraarterial pressure and lumen area. At low pressure, the pressure load is mainly taken up by elastin, and, uh, and the artery has high compliance. As pressure increases, the load is progressively shifted to, to stiffer collagen fibers leading to a functionally lower compliance. As the aorta is exposed to higher pressure, elastin are replaced by collagen um, in the aortic wall. So how does the aortic stiffness clinically affect um, thoracic aortic aneurysms? A recent study comparing aortic stiffness from imaging performed before dissection versus those with normal aorta. Pre-dissection echocardiogram demonstrated abnormal wall biomechanics in patients who not soon after sustained a type of aortic dissection. 
dissected patients uh, were found to have decreased aortic wall distensibility and elevated stiffness before the event compared to patients with normal aorta. Studies by Dr. Boxer and Dr. Coutinho from our own institution have found that measures that reflect the aortic, uh, aorta's health and function, such as aortic stiffness, central blood pressure, and postal arterial load, is, an independent, uh, is independently associated with future aneurysm expansion. These results were independent of clinical relevant variables and applicable to patients of different age and aneurysm ideology. Moreover, uh, these parameters are superior to baseline aneurysm size in the prediction of future aneurysm expansion. In relation to aortic stiffness, wall stress is also a potential proxy for prediction for aortic dissection. Wall stress is area exerted by moving fluid in the direction of that vessel and is dependent on the viscosity of the fluid and the velocity gradient near the vessel wall. From an engineering perspective, dissection is a biomechanical failure of the aortic wall that occurs when aortic aneurysm wall stress exceeds wall strength. Wall stress increase can cause significant maladaptive remodeling, mainly in the medial layer, producing defective muscle cell components as well as extracellular matrix proteins that, that disrupts aortic wall homeostasis, causing adverse remodeling and formation of TAAs. Uh, wall stress studies have often been performed for patients with bicuspid aortic valves. Blood flow out of a normal tricuspid aortic valve in a laminar fashion with little turbulence. BAV can be, can be caused by fusion of any of the two of the three cusps. As you can imagine, depending on where the fusion occurs, the flow of the blood coming out of the aortic valve can be different. Fusion of the right and non-coronary cusp was shown to have higher wall stress um, and larger areas in the aortic size relating to direction and turbulence of the flow. Further, further, further analyses on regional wall stress distribution in the ascending aorta of patients bicusp aortic valve were, and tricusp aortic valve was compared. They found elevated wall stress in the right anterior wall of the ascending aorta for right left fusion and right posterior wall for right non-fusion bicusp aortic valves. These regions correspond to create the greater curvature of the ascending aorta uh, the typical site for dilatation for patients with bicuspid aortic valve. An important recent studies has shown a direct link between wall stress and changes in the wall of ascending aorta by comparing histology of pieces of aortic wall in areas of high stress with low areas of low st uh, normal stress. They found increased TGF beta activity and matrix metalloproteinase activity in regions with high wall stress. As we have previously previously discussed, this indicates extracellular matrix uh, dysregulation and degradation. Furthermore, there was higher medial elastin degradation in regions of high wall stress. In this study, CT scan performed for patients before dissection events occurs were used to construct finite element simulations to obtain biomechanical stress map on the aortic wall. Wall stress is the highest uh, in the dark red section. Clinically observed dissection origin were found to be within or close to the area uh, where wall stress is the highest. In this case, does higher wall stress increase as aneurysm size increase? When comparing wall stress between TAs greater than 5 cm versus less than 5 cm, aneurysm greater than 5 cm on average had higher peak wall stress at the ACN aorta. However, the correlation between aneurysm size and wall stress is poor as demonstrated by our value here. There is quite a bit of overlap of peak wall stress between groups of different sizes. This points to the limitation of using size as the only clinical criteria for patient-specific risk stratification for aortic dissection. In summary, high aortic stiffness and high wall stress may thus promote a series, adverse, uh, series of adverse remodeling events, which produces thinning of the aortic wall, and in doing so, contribute to aneurysm formation. This may help to explain why some patients with aortic size below current interventional criteria develop acute aortic dissection. So having an understanding of pathophysiology and hemodynamics is important to then translate into clinical practice. For the following section, we'll focus on ascending aortic aneurysm. For patients with ascending aortic aneurysm, clinical decision-making will depend on the balance between surveillance and surgery. This really depends on our understanding of the natural history of the ascending aortic aneurysm versus risk stratification for surgery. What we really want to know is 
is the risk of surgery lower than the risk of acute aortic events in this particular, particular patient, given differences in these clinical variables? So let's talk about natural history first. The single most important question during surveillance for this patient with an aneurysm is, what is the risk of the patient having an acute aortic event? Everything else, all other parameters and indicators such as size or growth rate are all proxy variables contributing to the risk estimation. For this 60-year-old patient with an ascending aortic aneurysm, what is the risk of dissection or rupture? Let's first take a look at size as a predictor. Decision to operate is currently based on aortic size. Under the predicate that the larger the size, the more likelihood for the dissection and rupture, uh, and specifically for aneurysm due to degenerative causes at a size of 5.5 centimeter, we thought that the risk of aneurysm dissection and rupture is higher than the risk of surgery. From the same study, once the aneurysm becomes 6.0 centimeter, the yearly risk rupture, uh, of rupture or dissection more than doubles. However, there remains a significant portion of uh, patients who had acute aortic events whose aorta are smaller than those interventional thresholds. Data from the International Registry for Acute Aortic Dissection show that the highest incidence of acute aortic dissection actually occurs at aortic size between 5 to 5.4 centimeter which falls below the standardized size criteria of 5.5 centimeter. Now, keep in mind that this is a retrospective study, which only looked at patients who already had a dissection. It's very possible that the result is due to simply a function of larger population of patients with smaller aneurysms. Nonetheless, we seem to be missing a fair number of these patients who may incur events. In addition, it has been shown that the geometry of thoracic aorta is affected by aortic dissection, leading to an increase in diameter that is most pronounced in ascending aorta and the induced average increase of in the at the mid ascending uh, at the mid ascending aorta is 1.3 centimeter which if you think about it can essentially bump a patient from 4.2 centimeter to 5.5 centimeter these data seem to suggest to us that firstly significant significant portion of patients with aneurysm less than 5.5 centimeter will suffer an acute aortic event and that perhaps the size threshold of 5.5 centimeter may not be sufficient to understand what the natural history data of ascending aortic aneurysm looks like beyond the landmark paper that define our guidelines, we performed a comprehensive review and meta-analysis on studies published on the natural history of ascending aortic aneurysm. This is the forest plot looking at all the papers that reported on the growth rate of ascending aortic aneurysm with a tricuspid aortic valve. Firstly, there wasn't a lot of them. Secondly, the landmark paper that reported the hinge point of acute, uh, of acute aortic events is almost an outlier compared to other studies. As you can see, uh, the mean growth rate here is low at 0.3 millimeter per year. Similarly, for risk of acute aortic events or death, the same group reported higher rates than rate reported by other papers. The combined linearized rate of dissection, rupture, or death is 3.4% per patient year. It's important, however, to know that the initial aneurysm size for these patients was 4.3 centimeter, so they do not represent those with aneurysm greater than 5 centimeter. In addition, most of the studies follow surgical thresholds, uh, so patients receive elective surgery once reach, reaching the size threshold 5.5 centimeter. Nonetheless, this shows us that there is a lack of high quality data on the natural history of, of ascending aortic aneurysm less than 5.5 centimeter. As we saw earlier, when we looked at our survey results, 75% of surgeons will offer surgery at recommended threshold, with 20% offering surgery at 5.5 less than 5.5 centimeter and a very small portion at higher than recommended threshold. This shows that as a community, even for the most basic case, we do not all agree on what to do. What if the patient had a bicuspid aortic valve? When we looked at the hemodynamic studies before, BAB patients has higher wall stress. Does this translate, to, does this translate into any clinical significance? In our meta-analysis, it was also apparent that one outlier existed from the same group as we previously reported. Overall, the growth rate was numerically higher, but not significantly higher than patients with tricuspid aortic valve at 0.8 millimeter per, per year. Similarly, the combined linearized rate of dissection, rupture, or death is also low at 1.5% per patient year. In this case, most authors reported similar rates. Also, I'd like to draw your attention to the small sample size of patients that was used to derive the data. Please also bear in mind the limitation of the study regarding a small initial aneurysm size and the most patients we proceed to surgery with size threshold was met. 
Because of this, despite that histologically and hemodynamically, patients with BAV seem to have more damage to their aortic wall. Clinically, guidelines have shifted from combining BAV with other genetic mediated disorders in 2010, which recommended a threshold between 4 to 5 centimeter to 5.5 centimeter more recently, or 5.0 centimeter with risk factors. However, where guidelines differ is in regards to the definition of risk factors. <clears throat> risk factors for each guideline and task force is different. For example, what's considered as fast, for fast, fast growth rate varies from 0.2 centimeter to 0.3 centimeter to 0.5 centimeter per year. This is difficult for clinicians to follow and suggest that further studies to delineate each of these risk factors are important. The difference be becomes more apparent when we looked at our survey response. The response is almost evenly split between offering sur patient surgery at guideline recommended threshold versus lower threshold. Another factor that has stirred up some interest in is aortic size index to BSA. <clears throat> the idea is that patients <clears throat> with different body size have different baseline aorta size, and therefore index size may be better than absolute size and account for some of the dissections that occur below 5.5 centimeter. In this study, aortic size index of greater than 2.75, as marked by black line, green line, and yellow line, is deemed to have a higher risk of mortality compared to patients with smaller index sizes. Now, these patients perhaps should receive intervention even if the absolute size criteria is not reached. This concept intuit intuitively makes sense. However, because of the limited number of studies verifying this theory, controversies exist in whether this should be incorporated in clinical practice. And this controversy is, is again reflected in the survey results, where many surgeons uh, will offer surgery at smaller uh, sizes if the patient has smaller BSA, while others offer uh, would not change their size threshold, even if the patient has smaller BSA. Lastly, in recent years, there has been an increased recognition of sex and gender differences regarding the prevalence and natural history of aortic aneurysm. Thoracic aortic aneurysm occurs much more common in men. However, the prognosis is worse in women. Women have 40% increase in the risk of mortality compared to men and also have a threefold increase in the risk of dissection or rupture. Epidemiological data suggests that women presenting with uh, aortic aneurysm tend to be older than their male counterparts, and perhaps at, and perhaps at a more advanced uh, stage of disease when they come to clinical attention. In addition, there's evidence to suggest that more women than men suffer aortic dissection at smaller aneurysm size. Female, size, uh, female sex is an independent predictor, even after aortic annual size is indexed to BSA. It's also been it has also been shown that differences in sex can lead to disparities in growth rate. Dr. Broxer and Dr. Coutinho has shown here that aortic stiffness is associated with greater TA growth, more so in women than men. Although women are less likely to develop uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm, it's hypothesized that once they reach the threshold of having a TAA, they have higher disease burden at presentation. In addition, due to many factors, um, they may be uh, more at risk than their male counterparts to develop adverse events. At the same size, female patients may have a secure aorta more at risk of adverse events. However, in contrary to other areas of controversy, such as valve type or aortic size index, female sex does not seem to alter the surgical threshold for most surgeons. Given what we know so far, should this be the case? So really, the evidence of the natural history uh, of ACN aortic aneurysm and therefore the risk of a specific aneurysm proceeding to acute aortic dissection is poorly defined. On the other hand, let's take a look at risk of surgery. To emphasize this point over and over again, the risk of surgery must be lower than the risk of surveillance to justify offering invasive surgery for an asymptomatic patient. In broad categories, there's three types of surgery uh, we do for these patients with ascending aortic aneurysm. Root surgery, ascending aortic surgery, and arch surgery to treat aneurysm at these three different locations within the ascending aorta. As you can see, um, ascending aortic surgery is the simplest, Roof surgery is a bit more complex, and uh, arch surgery is the most involved. Over the past decade, the risk of have, uh, for having an elective aortic surgery has drastically decreased. For ascending aorta and root surgery, 
based on Society of Thoracic Surgeon data, mortality is approximately 1 to 2 percent, with a risk of stroke of around 1 to 1.5 percent. At our own institution, in 300 consecutive patients who underwent the surgery, mortality raised 1 percent and risk of stroke is around 1 to 1.2 percent. Multivariable analyses with the SDS data published also show that these factors may lead to higher risk of periop events. And these variables should be considered when offering patients with surgery to ensure that the balance is tipped towards the right side. Arch surgery has a much higher risk of periop events. In a Canadian collaborative data set of 12 institutions, the risk of death is 3.5% and stroke of 12%. This is because it's a much more involved surgery, including complex management of the brain perfusion during surgery, details of which we don't need to get into in this presentation. However, these are crew numbers, and each of the patient's own demographic comorbidities could impact their outcome. How does individual factors affect the outcome of surgery? In this study, we showed that the patient, patients who are greater than 75 years old have worsening hospital and long-term outcome uh, for elective surgery, aortic surgery. This may seem intuitive, but even this point is debated in the, in the literature, with some papers showing that the outcome are similar between elderly and younger patients. Using a national multicenter collaborative database, we created the ARCH score, a risk uh, score calculator that could assist in predicting the risk of mortality and periop morbidity in aortic arch surgery. This is the first uh, score created specifically for aortic arch surgery, which carries a significant um, high risk of mortality and morbidity and may provide some guidance for surgeons in terms of which side of the balance to, um, the patient will tip towards when seeing their patients and consenting their patients. Although the risk score has its own limitations based on data cohorts created from, it's a step towards the right direction. Ultimately, there's many factors that apply to both sides that could either increase or decrease risk of events or, uh, uh, or the risk of surgery. And these are just a few examples. At the end of the day, we want to make sure that our balance is tipped in a way to minimize the patient's risk. Unfortunately, there's so much that we do not know on both, both sides of the balance. But knowing that there's limited evidence is the first step. Let's take a step back and review what we do know. Firstly, to take a step back and look at the literature examining aortic aneurysm. We know that based on literature from abdominal aortic aneurysm, which, in which a multiple, randomized, multiple randomized control trial has been conducted, Surgery for aneurysm less than 5.5 centimeter does not provide benefit. Similarly, for patients with abdominal aortic aneurysm greater than 5.5 centimeter, the one year incidence of probable rupture was 9%, quite a significant number. Therefore, size seems to be a good first starting point. From our own literature, this is still the best natural history study we have. When aneurysm increase above 6.0 centimeter, the risk of acute aortic events significantly increases. In addition, in an updated study with more patients um, by the same group, they've also identified a hinge point, earlier hinge point of 5.25 centimeter, which led to this paper. In this paper, the authors described their strategy of offering surgery to all patients with an aneurysm greater than 5.0 centimeter and compared the outcome of those who have gone through the surgery and those who did not want surgery. They found that patients who did not follow the surgical recommendation from the algorithm had a substantial worse outcome compared to those surgically treated. In the meantime, they followed their patients with an aneurysm between 4 to 4.9 centimeter and found that the risk of aortic events is low in this cohort. Therefore, at present time, the guideline from American, Canadian, and Europe still recommends 5.5 centimeter as a size, size threshold for intervention. There is so much more to be done and it needs to be approached from both sides of the scale. From the surveillance side, we need a better understanding of the natural history of thoracic aortic aneurysm. We need better studies on patients with genetic mediated thoracic aortic disease. We need, not, we need to not only have a good understanding of the impact of various hemodynamics parameters have on thoracic aortic aneurysm, but also a better understanding of their clinical consequences. We need better natural history studies in younger or elderly patients. <clears throat> From the surgery side, we need better risk stratification of patients referred for surgery. In addition, in addition, we need to have a better understanding in the impact of thoracic aortic aneurysm in the quality of life of patients. To many patients, an aneurysm is like a ticking time bomb and may significantly impact their stress and, and anxiety level. 
Similarly, patients who have survived type A aortic dissection often have remnant disease in their thoracic or abdominal aorta, and we do not know how these remnant disease alter the quality of life for these patients. Currently, we're in the process of designing aortic aneurysm specific questionnaire that will hopefully address some of these questions. Lastly, to integrate both sides, a randomized control trial comparing surveillance and surgery, much like those done in the abdominal aortic aneurysm literature, is required. In the past few years, we have initiated the treatment in thoracic aortic aneurysm surgery versus surveillance trial, Titan SVS trial. The trial will randomize patients with an aneurysm between 5 to 5.4 centimeter, for, uh, for which we believe there's clinical equipoi, to either surgery or surveillance. Follow-up follow will be done annually for both groups up to five years. And at the end of it, uh, we will compare the difference in death, dissection or rupture, stroke, as well as quality of life. In addition, as part of the trial, there's also an ongoing registry that enrolls patients, patients who refuse to participate in the trial, which will provide us with more uh, further natural history data in this patient population. The Titan SBS trial has acquired CIHR funding and have initiated enrollment in 14 centers across North America with 45 patients actively randomized so far. And that concludes my presentation. I'd like to thank Dr. Budoni for his mentorship and guidance throughout my residency in and outside of the OR on surgical techniques, research, career, and life prospects. I'm forever in debt. I also like to thank Dr. Coutinho for thoroughly reviewing my presentation and providing valuable feedback uh, to make the presentation better. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to my Ottawa cardiac surgery family who made the six year residency much more tolerable. Thank you. Any questions are welcomed. Thank you, Ming. Uh, that was excellent. Um, I remind people that they can uh, send their questions in through the, uh, the chat box. Um, I have a couple questions um, for you, both you and, uh, and Munir if, uh, if need be. Um, you talked a little bit about the various genetic mutations um, with some of the familial aerotopathies. Can you comment on you know, the role of genetic testing um, for patients and their families? And you know, at what point should we, we be referring patients to the aorta clinic for um, you know, uh, discussion regarding these things? Um, so I think in terms of genetic testing, the practice is pretty varied uh, between uh, institutions based on really based on access to these testing uh, um, uh, uh, method methodologies. So, for example, at Yale, I believe they test uh, most patients who come in um, with any evidence of familial transmission or even um, patients with start to have through a sporadic aneurysm, they would test them uh, to see if there's any new genes that could be identified. Um, in our institution, um, I think only patients who have a, really have shown a familial um, pattern will be referred to a geneticist uh, for further on investigation. Um, certainly not every patient will be tested. Um, I think as an ongoing uh, study, um, patients with who came in with aneurysms, well, first of all, most uh, patients should be referred to aortic clinic um, with an aneurysm. Um, for better understanding of their past medical history, history as well as um, a follow-up for ongoing surveillance and decision making. Um, at aortic rounds, we also have geneticists involved. Um, so if there's uh, any sort of evidence of possible genetic transmission, um, the patient will be referred to that geneticist for further evaluation. Um, Dr. Brown, I'm not sure if there's anything else that um, you'd like to add here. Um, you know, the, the only comment I would make, um, uh, I think that's a very good response. Um, our needle is shifting over time in terms of who we use genetic testing on, partly because more and more genes are becoming um, uh, more, uh, we're becoming more aware of some of these genes um, that we were unaware of, say, 10 years ago. Um, what we practically do in Ottawa today is that if someone presents with an aneurysm with an obvious uh, first degree family connection uh, to aerotopathy, we refer them for a genetics assessment, which is based out of CHEO. We have Dr. Julie Richet, who's our uh, geneticist part of the clinic. Um, and uh, based on their assessment, they will go through a vascular panel um, uh, and, and look at uh, any affected genes. In addition, if there are any younger patients who don't have family history, but have had a major event like an aortic dissection, uh, when I say younger patients, we're thinking under the age of 60, 
uh, we would uh, we would also refer those individuals on. Um, and then the, the last uh, piece of this is, you know, how does genetic testing actually impact our decision making? Um, largely, uh, it doesn't affect it for the pro band, but it could have an important impact for the family members who screen positive uh, in terms of how they're surveyed and how they're followed and how frequently they're imaged, etc. Uh, if they have if they're gene positive versus not, regardless of whether they have the phenotype or not. OK, um, we've got quite a few questions uh, to get to. So from uh, from Dr. Burwash, um, one of the problems with indexing um, aortic size to BSA is obesity, and we all know that there's a large uh, prevalence of obesity in the population. Um, is there any data to support indexing to height instead? Absolutely. Um, so again, from the same group um, who really, from the Yale group, who really driven, be driven, be driving a lot of these um, evidence behind the uh, the natural history. Um, they've certainly looked at height as a in a height to aortic size as an index. And uh, they found that comparing to indexing the BSA, indexing the height alone um, is um, is enough to uh, predict uh, adverse outcomes. Now, again, say similar to BSA, um, there is not a lot of, sort of ver verification data out there to uh, support this um, uh, this study. Um, even at least for BSA, there there might be a couple out there, but for height, is really just from their group uh, that looked at this. OK, so more data needed, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely, like everything yeah. else. Yeah. Um, from Dr. Davies, um, his uh, comment is, uh, you showed a big difference in complications depending upon the type of surgery that is performed. Um, do you factor this um, surgical risk into the, the threshold for when you operate? Yes, for sure. So um, that's that's really the crux of the problem um, here is that we want to make sure that surgical risk is lower than the uh, risk of surveillance. And so when we talk, spoke with the pa speak to patients, um, is especially if they have a, a full arch that's involved uh, in their aneurysm, we will discuss at length with them regards to the complications um, that may occur from that. And uh, for arch aneurysm, our, our threshold is typically slightly higher than if they were to just have a standard aortic aneurysm with maybe proximal arch involved, at which the, the risk is not uh, significantly higher. But um, uh, certainly if if uh, they require a full arch procedure, that discussion is thoroughly had with the patient. And that's the other thing is that we don't really have a good risk prediction score in, uh, or system in terms of looking at these uh, when we speak with these patients. Um, a lot of these uh, discussions that we have with patients are sometimes based on just based on clinical judgment and based on experience um, in dealing with uh, patients with specific comorbidities and, and specific body type and things like that. So um, certainly again, more more uh, more better delineation in terms of surgical risk um, and perhaps a useful surgical risk prediction score will be good here. Um, I guess along those lines in the the simplest version of, of your three surgical options where you just yeah. um, replace the, the ascending aorta and you leave the native root intact. Um, I certainly have a couple patients in my practice where now the native root is starting to dilate. Right. Yeah, so I was wondering if you could comment, you know, um, on the, the risk of that and do you have still have the same cut points for, you know, um, addressing the root uh, now that you've got an ascending graft, you know, interposed. Yeah, so um, typically at the index surgery, um, if the any segment of the aorta um, or around the root or ascending aorta is around 4.5 centimeter, that's kind of the cutoff that we have now, um, we'll probably try to address it. So in addition, um, we also take into consideration the patient's body size as well. And sometimes if a very small female patient with let's say a 4.2 centimeter, 4.3 centimeter aorta um, for another indication for cardiac surgery, that may be something that we would address as well. And adding a ascending aortic surgery, um, slash root surgery to um, uh, another index cardiac surgery procedure doesn't really increase the risk by that much. Now, if you already have a ascending aortic graft and had uh, index cardiac surgery, and now we're looking into redo surgery, 
then the balance um, between surveillance and risk of surgery tips towards the other way. So you would really have to take into consideration the risk of having a redo surgery and make sure that the risk is lower than um, following up on this patient. So factors that would take into consideration would be the age of, age of the patient. If the patient is 75 or 80 years old, and if their root is 4.7 centimeters, um, is it worthwhile to go in there? Are they going to, um, are they going to incur events, likely incur event before they uh, pass away from other uh, clinical problems? Um, if there are younger patients, uh, that may change the question a little bit. But you, we really do um, take consideration into the uh, redo risk and, um, and think about also the risk of the patient incurring events uh, in the long term. Okay, uh, comment from Dr. Ruel. Um, he's wondering if you could comment about medical therapy options or options, I'm sorry, uh, in either familial or syndromic versus non-syndromic patients. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in in uh, syndromic patients, specifically Marfan syndrome, there is uh, quite a bit of data looking at, and randomized control trial also looking at uh, specifically the use of um, uh, losartan in uh, slowing aneurysm growth. And the really the, the pathophysiology behind it is really to curb the TGF beta signaling pathway, well, which we've talked about. Um, in non-syndromic uh, familial TAs, I don't think there's much, we just don't know much about them at all in terms of medical management and surgical management. Um, for sporadic TAs, uh, especially degenerative type, there isn't a lot of data that suggests um, a specific medical management would be better, um, uh, would slow the, either slow the growth or uh, decrease the events. Um, but we do recommend the use of what we call maximum medical therapy involving uh, really the uh, controlling blood pressure and especially um, uh, there are some observational studies that suggest that using a statin medication can also uh, decrease growth rate and potentially lower risk. So that uh, is one thing for sure. And also beta blockers. So these are the three things uh, for medical management that we would recommend. A question from Dr. LeMay. Um, could you comment on uh, CT versus transthoracic echo and the frequency of uh, surveillance testing? That's a very good question. Um, so, um, so CT scan is really is the gold standard in terms of measuring uh, aortic size. Um, uh, even for CT scan, there's ways of measuring it using double oblique uh, angle to make sure that you're measuring the aneurysm size at a, at a sort of a, uh, uh, good cross section coupling to make sure the measurement is correct. Um, echo is better, certainly better in a way for, maybe better in a way for surveillance, really because of the decreasing um, radiation risk. Um, so it really depends on what uh, we considered as, um, what we considered is a risk of the patient for growing, rap uh, for having a rapidly growing aorta or aorta that's sort of closer to size uh, that requires surgical intervention. Let's say if the patient has a 4.5 centimeter aorta and the patient is 75 years old. Um, we, and, and based on the data that we've shown, uh, the aneurysm growth rate may be low. Um, echocardiogram may not be a, a uh, echocardiogram, annual echocardiogram may not be um, a bad choice for um, surveillance. And also for patients who had a ascending aortic or uh, aortic surgery, um, and your surveillance echocardiogram may not be a bad idea. But if the patient is more uh, on the cusp of requiring surgical intervention or has other, other risk factors that may um, make us think that the aneurysm might be growing a bit faster, then CT scan, annual or biannual CT scan, would be important. Yeah, and as an echocardiographer, I would add, you know, sometimes we can't always see the ascending aorta that well. It's largely dependent on on the patient and what kind of windows we can get. So we can we can certainly miss spots uh, that you're not going to miss uh, with CT. Um, Dr. Catino has a comment. Um, her comment um, uh, uh, states that you know the guidelines are very much dependent upon surgical risk and your estimation of surgical risk. And we all know that surgical risk is largely institution dependent and expertise uh, dependent. So do you know um, what the risks of death and major complications from elective isolated aortic repair are uh, at our institution? And do you know if there's any uh, differences between men and women 
uh, for those uh, for those surgical risks. Right. So at our own institution, the risk of isolated ascending aortic replacement or root replacement is around uh, 1% for mortality and 1.2% for stroke. Um, for aortic arch surgery, I have to I haven't uh, to be honest take a, taken a look into it. Um, in terms of um, differences in sex, there has been a paper uh, recently published using a Canadian multicenter database looking at arch surgery specifically where female was shown to have worse outcome compared to males. Um, so that's certainly an important uh, finding that needs to be um, a follow up on. Uh, Dr. Budoni, do you have any additional comments for that? Yeah, I, I think um, the, the question is a good one. I think it's a very practical one. Um, the numbers uh, Ming has already stated. I would say that uh, historically, uh, we, we actually did a comparison a while back looking at uh, before we had a dedicated thoracic aortic program uh, to after having a dedicated thoracic aortic program and actually saw a reduction in mortality rates, almost having of mortality rates. So, you know, the, the notion that um, if you have a good multidisciplinary program, looking at these patients actually impacts outcome was actually demonstrated in our institution. Um, but it, a lot of these numbers, a lot of the risk benefit thresholds only makes sense if your mortality threshold, mortality rates are below a certain level, and in this case, in the range of around one percent um, for elective descending surgery. Okay, um, a question from uh, Dr. Boshane: um, uh, Will TVAR for ascending aortic aneurysm uh, be an option in the near future? So um, there is kind of some preliminary data and studies out there looking at this, and um, this is certainly where the field may, may potentially be advancing towards. Um, there, uh, a couple of years ago, there is a um, uh, endobental procedure that was done in Brazil for a patient that was prohibitive was at, pre at uh, prohibitive risk for for uh, aortic surgery. So where they did a uh, bental procedure endovascularly, and now that has not been the that hasn't really been a um, common practice and hasn't really caught on as much, mainly because of the um, really the anatomy of the aortic uh, ascending aorta and aortic arch, where in the descending and thoracic aorta and abdominal aorta, uh, you can potentially cover some blood vessels without causing too much issues because of collateral circulation. In the aortic arch, um, you have to really consider in, 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 into what vessels need to be saved to make sure that you have a decrease. You don't have the patient doesn't have a stroke or end up uh, uh, passing away from brain injury. And in addition, um, the anatomy of the ascending aortic aneurysm can also be different. Whereas in the descending aorta and abdominal aorta, you have a long segment of uh, aorta, and you have a, if you have a localized aneurysm, you can potentially uh, consideration is that you can potentially put a stent in and you'll anchor on both sides of the aneurysm where there's normal aorta. When you have a aneurysm in the ascending aorta and the arch, um, the, almost all often the entire ascending aorta and arch in, is, is ectatic. So there may not be a place where you can actually land the graft. So these are some kind and in addition, and the last thing would really be the coronary perfusion. And if you were to go down uh, towards the aortic root, um, well, how do you uh, save coronary perfusion? Uh, from being compromised. So these are a couple considerations in terms of looking at endovascular options for ascending aorta. Now, uh, on the other hand, uh, what we often do is if the patient has an aortic arch aneurysm and um, one way to potentially mitigate the risk a little bit. Now, this is not very evidence based, but um, we can uh, what we call debranching the arch vessels where we don't actually touch the arch. We don't replace the arch, but we um, disconnect the aortic arch uh, vessels and reconnect it to grafts uh, attaching to the ascending aorta. In the future, uh, that will really provide a length of aorta that may be normal for, um, for us to land a endograft into. Um, there's ways of incorporating, into, uh, incorporating endovascular techniques into our surgery, and that's certainly a way of where the um, future investigation will t uh, head towards, but as of now, um, there isn't much um, uh, progress or, or utility. Okay, um, one more question uh, from the audience and then uh, Dr. Beanlands has a, a couple questions. So a um, uh, question from Dr. Burbosh, uh, what is our uh, complication risk uh, post-operatively of having graft complications uh, 
annually. So not the end. I don't think he's getting at the index surgery, but you know, yeah. going forward, what is the complication risk of a graft? Dr. Bidouin, would you? Uh, in, uh, um, I'm not sure. Um, I have to say, um, the, it, it's not. So I guess from we're we're talking about uh, aneurysm formation, distal to graft, as well as uh, uh, an, asthma, asthma, an asthmatic side disruptions or. Is that I, I would think, yeah, I'm not, yeah, Ian hasn't really clarified. He's just phrased it as what is the complication risk of a graft and follow up. So, I mean, just anecdotally read all the echoes they read. I would think it would be quite right. low as in, you know, less than a percent per year. But I don't know if you, if your team has data on that. Dr. Yeah, Bidoni, you... yeah I, I can speak. There are two populations that I, I would think about. One is uh, the patient that has an elective aortic operation. And the second is the population that has a type A dissection repair. And the, the complication risk um, is very different in both. The risk, uh, we do routine CTs at one year post uh, descending aortic surgery in all of our patients in the aortic clinic. And the number of patients that require reoperation for graft related issue. Uh, I'm talking about not a new site aneurysm, but a graft related issue uh, is extremely low, like uh, you know, uh, a handful of cases over 10 years. Um, the, on the other hand, in the dissection population, we do see the risk of pseudoaneurysms uh, or rapid progression of the aorta immediately beyond the graft implanted. Um, and I think that's a, that's a whole different kettle of fish that um, we have a higher risk uh, in the literature and in Ottawa in our own experience and, and we manage them in, in, in different ways. But for elective surgery, uh, risk of aortic graft related complications is extremely, extremely low. One last uh, thing to think about is graft infection. Uh, that's another thing that can lead to reoperation. Again, risk of complications very low. The number of cases are like, you know, two, three, four over a period of 10 years. Yeah, okay. I think I'll uh, hand uh, moderator over to uh, Dr. Beanland who has a couple questions. Ming, first, uh, let me say this was a great presentation. I, I really liked how you uh, presented the material in an understandable way for us cardiologists um, <coughs> um, uh, and everyone, uh, as well as highlighting the, the work of the team, um, uh, both in cardiology and cardiac surgery, um, and uh, giving a, a good period of time for discussion, which you can see was quite healthy. Um, and lots of great engagement in, in the presentation and the discussion. So thank you very much for that. Um, okay. I have a couple of questions um, and perhaps um, this is maybe more directed to Dr. Cacchino, but you or your Dr. Budwani could um, answer this and I'll basically have a few. I'll just tell you what the questions are and then you can uh, go to town. So first is, you know, is stiffness ready to be a parameter that we include in trying to um, predict, given the data that you showed, uh, to predict the patients who are at greater risk, uh, should it be added at some point? And you know, how close are we to that? Um, the next is that you, you showed the, the uh, data across the country. It is interesting that one in five um, uh, surgeons are, are taking patients who are um, outside the, the recommended guidelines for size and so on. And I wondered if you solicited reasons for why those those patients did under, undertake uh, surgery. And then uh, finally, um, what is the, uh, is there a size of aorta um, uh, aneurysm that you would like the patients to be referred to the clinic? And what are, I, I, I just looked into EPIC and I, it's not clear on the cardiology path or is a cardiac surgery path for how to how to get the patient into the aortic clinic. So if you could give us some in, insight into that. And finally, um, you, you did present this, but maybe just because it's so important for us to support this, if you could uh, reiterate the the um, the type of patient that would be indicated for the trial so we can try to enable that. So several questions first on stiffness next uh, on the surgery in the country. Uh, then on referrals and then the trial. Perfect. Um, so for, uh, I'll go, go through them one by one. Um, so for aerolic stiffness, um, uh, I think it has great utility in terms of um, uh, measuring the, uh, predicting whether patients will have a higher growth rate uh, 
uh, compared to others. Um, on the other hand, um, I think we re even for growth rates, we don't know how it impacts the clinical outcome of these patients with an aneurysm. We don't really know whether faster growth rates, uh, we, we, do, we, we assume it to be, but uh, and it too, intuitively makes sense, um, but we don't know whether increased growth rate uh, or how growth rate overall impacts on the uh, having an adverse event clinically moving forward. So I think um, uh, sort of a, connect, a connection between aortic stiffness and other hemodynamic parameters as well as the clinical outcomes would be a, a good first, uh, uh, first uh, next step as well. And I, I think Dr. Coutinho has a prospective study um, that's coming up uh, addressing uh, some of these questions. Um, in terms of the uh, uh, reasons for uh, operating on below the size threshold, this really comes down to the controversy that we have in terms of uh, among the aortic surgeons or cardiac surgeons in general, at, at which point should we offer the patient surgery? If you look, if you fully wholeheartedly believe the Yale uh, data, you would believe that even at five centimeters, the patient is at a higher risk of having acute aortic events. Uh, so in, this will be a basis of offering the patient surgery. So, um, so that's why uh, the uh, the size between 5.0 to 5.4 centimeter is really an area that we felt there is clinical equipoise, and we really don't know what's what's going on here um, to really instigate into uh, include that into the to to have that uh, trial uh, set up around that uh, size threshold. Um, uh, the uh, the third question I'll, I'll let Dr. Budwani to answer in terms of referral to aortic clinic. And the last question for uh, the, the Titan trial, we're really looking at patients between five uh, with aneurysm of, at the ascending aorta or aortic root at a maximum ascending aortic or root uh, diameter between 5.0 to 5.4 centimeter um, to be included in the trial. And you can um, let us know, uh, refer this, these patients to us, and we will have a research coordinator to screen the patients for, uh, for eligibility for the trial. And then um, if they're eligible, then we can ask them to, uh, we can explain the trial to them and potentially enroll them. Is there a different cutoff for bicuspid patients? There, the, uh, that's a very good question. There isn't. Because based on what we know so far, bicuspid aortic valve patients actually doesn't seem to have a higher rate of uh, adverse events compared to tricuspid aortic valve patients. That's one of the questions that we are looking to answer actually uh, in a trial is that we'll enroll these patients that both have the same size threshold um, but we'll look at uh, subgroup analysis and see whether there's a difference. Thanks, Ming. Uh, I know we're at the end of our time, so I'll keep this short. First of all, thanks uh, to Ming for a very uh, excellent presentation, as Rob indicated, but also for the five years of kind of input and energy that he's put into this area and, and published widely in so many different areas of uh, aortic surgery. And it's really helped to advance our field locally and, and you know globally as well. Um, how do you refer patients to the aortic clinic? We see them in many different ways. Sometimes they go to the cardiac surgery uh, pool, uh, but there's actually a separate area called the UHI thoracic aortic pool within the, the referral bins where you can refer to, which will uh, enable the patients to come directly to us. We then triage them amongst the eight physicians that are part of this clinic and, and Catherine McLean, who's the clinic coordinator helps uh, with some of that work. So there is a separate entity there is some ambiguity and sometimes we hear about this, about how to send the patient. Maybe we can articulate that separately and send a separate communication around that. Thanks. Is there a size that you would recommend the patients yeah. be referred? Good question. Um, I would say 4.5 centimeters or higher seems reasonable, uh, unless you're concerned about familial orthopathy. And, and in those cases, we sometimes see people between 4.0 and 4.5 as well, uh, if there's a particularly aggressive uh, phenotype uh, that you're concerned about. But certainly patients over 4.5, uh, we uh, use them both for better understanding of the natural history of the disease, and then we continue to follow them from a clinical standpoint. Thanks. Back, back to you, Ellie. Great. Well, th this is excellent, Ming. And uh, as you can see, there's a huge interest in this population. Uh, Dr. Katina just texted me because she uh, doesn't have uh, microphone access. But yes, in, as, in keeping with what you said, uh, the aortic stiffness isn't quite prime time yet, uh, but uh, there is some uh, very promising data in this regard for risk stratification. And she just received a CIHR grant to uh, to uh, have a multicenter study looking at aortic stiffness and central pulse pressure. Uh, to develop a clinical risk score. So um, more to come in this arena. Again, thank you very much for this great presentation. Um, two announcements. Uh, next week is grand rounds for the Institute hosted by Dr. Liu. 
Dr. Harmony Reynolds will be uh, speaking from NYU. Uh, she's an international expert on Minoka, so please join us for that presentation. Uh, remember Grand Rounds, there will be a Zoom invite sent out to join. Um, and also, uh, I'd just like to thank Bob Eldford for all of his help uh, with arranging rounds on the IT. Uh, this is Bob's last week at the Heart Institute as he's retiring, so we will miss him greatly. Uh, and I don't know who's going to fix my phone going forward. So uh, nonetheless, have a good week, everyone, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Ellie, and indeed, best wishes to Bob.